I'm Arthur, or Art, uh, and I'm a software developer. I've been for longer than I care to admit at this point. And I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a neurologist or anything cool like that. I'm a software developer, like most of y'all. I just really love brains. Not like in the weird, creepy zombie way, like in the talk Jerry just gave about zombie scrum. But I like brains because I love learning about how they work and about kind of the, the methodology and the ways that they function and how we can take the things that we're learning there and use them to be better people, to be better developers, to be better coworkers, to make the world a better place, both for each other and for the people who use our software. I work at Aventure, which is just up the road in Omaha. Um, we're a software development shop. We have a booth upstairs, um, raffling off a, well, I shouldn't say we're raffling it off because I'm gonna steal it. The Lego Atari 2600. So you can't have it, it's mine. Actually, I'm probably gonna have to fight Jerry for it. No, we're raffling it off, so feel free to drop by and uh, say hi to us. So let's start with a story. A long time ago, a long, long time ago now, um, I was in my first tech lead position, and this was at a company in Omaha. It was my first job in Omaha. I'd just moved there, and I was tech lead for this internal framework that we had. This was thick client Java stuff, so it was a great Java framework, and you know, I know that's an oxymoron. But I was part of taking part in this meeting that we had, and we had a weekly meeting with my internal framework, me and a couple people from my team, and the leads of all of the other projects who were, by the way, required to use our internal framework for licensing and, and a whole bunch of other reasons I want to get into now. But I had a coworker who was a lead of a different project, and his name was Jim. And Jim lived in Hawaii. So I already didn't like Jim. <laughs> Mysteriously, because we were a defense contractor, we had offices curiously close to a number of major Air Force or naval bases. And so he got to live in Hawaii and I was in Omaha, Nebraska. And we started this meeting and it was supposed to be a touch base of like, here's where we're at, here's where we're going with this framework, what are the major pitfalls you're running into, how can we, you know, what is the shape of this thing, and just sync up with each other and try and figure out how we were, what the direction we were taking this. And Jim immediately starts launching into how a particular piece of functionality that he's the only one that uses and he's the only one that asked for it doesn't work the way he's expecting it to work. And he starts launching into how we're all idiots and we're not doing things right. And I respond by saying some extremely unkind things about his mother. He responds by questioning my entire heritage and we are off the rails. We spent 30 minutes arguing with each other with a bunch of other tech leads in the room or on the phone just kind of blinking. It was awkward. I've not had many meetings that were as acrimonious as that since. Actually, I don't think I've had one that topped it. But I spent a long time trying to figure out what the hell happened in that meeting? How did things get so bad so quickly? And luckily, I've done a bunch of readings, and I've come to the conclusion that it was brains that did it. The brain happened. That's what. Great. Talk over. We're done here. No. <laughs> Our relationships are important. We're human beings and we're social animals. And our relationships matter to us in a number of different ways and in across a number of different groups. And that includes our work relationships. Even if you include since the pandemic, our work relationships are still a significant number of the social encounters that we have on a regular basis. How would you get anything done? if you didn't have a relationship with that coworker that knows that thing, or with your boss, or with these other coworkers that you need to accomplish tasks? How would you get anything done if they couldn't trust you or you couldn't trust them? You wouldn't. You need those people. Because software is now far too big for any one person to build it themselves for any credible length of time. All of these relationships together make up a huge part of who we are our identities. And then our brain shows up and just makes complete hash of all of it. 
So let's learn about what's going on there and figure out what we can do to stop it. Today, we're going to learn about the walled garden in the dark forest. If you saw my keynote last year, you're going to hear about this again. We're then going to talk about what a cognitive bias is. And then we're going to talk about some debiasing techniques you can use to actually help defeat these things. And lastly, we're going to talk about some very specific biases and how to use those techniques in those cases. We tend to feel like the conscious mind is the be all end all of what we are. And we feel like the brain is the preeminent organ, which is hysterical because if you go back into history, the Greeks thought the heart was the human, like where the soul lived. The Egyptians thought so little of the human brain that they just like pulled it out through the nose as part of the mummification process and just like yeeted it on the floor. But in the modern era, we think of our brains as where everything that is us is happening. But your conscious mind isn't the biggest thing that's going on up there. Let's talk about the walled garden in the dark forest. I want you to think of the conscious part of your brain, the part that you think of as you, as this resident of a very nice, very good walled garden with very tall, thick galls, walls. rather. And it's really nice in there. There's all kinds of fun things to do. This is your intentional self. This is the self that acts, that you think of as you. And outside of the walls of that garden is the dark forest. This is everything else that your brain does. This walled garden is your autonomous self. The parts of you that you don't know are operating, that you can't even see operating. And the trick of it is, the walls of that garden are very thick. You can't see through them. You have no idea what is happening inside of the dark forest. Now, you can throw messages over the wall. Your intentional self can yeet messages over the wall, and something in the dark forest yeets something back. And you can read those messages, but you have no idea what threw them or how it arrived at that particular message or why it answered the way it did. Conscious intentional thought is actually a fairly small portion of what your brain does on a regular basis. In fact, the vast bulk of what your brain does is completely out of your reach. You can't even access it. You have no idea what's going on or that it's even going on. You, your intentional self, is really largely not in control of what goes on in your own brain. Now, the fact that a lot of you are disagreeing with me about that statement in your head is called the introspection illusion. We want to believe that we have access to what's called the antecedents of your behavior, the things that made you behave the way you do. But we don't. We really, really, really feel like we do, but we really, really don't. And that means we don't often know why we're doing things. We have an answer, but it isn't always right. And this is because of the interplay between your intentional self and your autonomous self. So let's talk about that a second. When a message comes over the wall, your intentional self has a chance to kind of inspect it and look at that and think about it and decide if it's valuable. And so your intentional self might go, okay, avocados, pros and cons. We're going to go down. Okay. So it's creamy, good fats, guacamole, etc. cetera. Um, it, on the other hand, it's eat, like there's rock and it goes instantly to mush. People call them alligator pears. I don't know why. It's like they're really slippery. You can cut yourself on the pit. Like you can just spend ages going down these particular pros and cons, right? Spending forever thinking about these things. But this takes energy. This takes effort. Your intentional mind, your conscious self, actually takes a ton of sugar to run. This is one of the reasons why you can spend all day in a desk chair thinking for eight hours and go home exhausted because you actually are burning sugar. And this process of kind of holding two realities in your head at the same time is a state called cognitive dissonance. And your brain really does not like that. And we try to avoid it as much as possible. So doing this is hard. And so what happens is, is we end up doing this thing called confabulation. We look at that message and we just assume that this is a thing I think, or this is a thing I feel. And then your conscious and your intentional, your intentional self and your autonomous self work together to basically make up a story about why it's true. This is confabulation. 
So as an example, you might think that you don't like avocados because avocados are a little slimy and every time you eat them, you get a little bit nauseated. Okay, seems reasonable. But the actual truth of the matter is the first time you had avocados, it was at Disney World and it was 110 degrees in the shade. You got heat stroke and you ended up puking up avocados through your nose in a Disney World bathroom. You were three, you do not remember this. Your parents absolutely remember the story, but you don't. All you have is left is this lingering somatic experience of associating nausea with avocados. And you've invented a story for why that's true that has nothing to do with the reality. The antecedents of your behavior are hidden from you. This interaction happens in part because your intentional self is actually kind of just an exception handler for your autonomous self. As long as you are doing familiar things in familiar environments, you're largely running on autopilot. As an example, think about driving to work if that's a thing you still do. How many people have ever driven to work and you get there and you do not remember the drive? Look around, that should be terrifying. <laughs> but it's not, because we all kind of understand that what's going to happen is your autonomous self is going to take the wheel gently and just go, okay, you intentional self, go think your big brain thoughts over there about what you're gonna do at work and the tacos you're gonna have for dinner and all of these fun things about planning and being about the future. And partially, that's what makes us human. Being able to predict and envision futures that don't exist yet and may never exist is a big part of what differentiates us as humans from a lot of other species, at least as far as we know so far. Call me when a crow starts writing a sci-fi story. Maybe an octopus, I don't know. Anyhow, if you're on that drive though and your intentional self is kind of thinking about the things and your autonomous self has got the wheel, you bet your ass, if you saw an elephant in the road, your autonomous self is gonna raise its hand and go, um, excuse me, I need assistance because I've never encountered this before. That's a big part of what your intentional self does. It handles novelty, newness. And when we are on autopilot, when we are tired, when we are frustrated, when we are emotional, we often skip that step of examining the messages coming over the wall and we just roll with them. And the dark forest is full of all of these other processes going on. Your intentional self is really a thin veneer over a bunch of other selves. And together they form kind of this howling parliament of voices that are constantly clamoring for your attention, trying to get you to pay attention to things that they think are important about there's sugar here, or here's something you could benefit from, or here's a thing over here you should be paying attention to. But they're not just these people. They're from an older, darker time. They're wolves. Now, the conceptualization of this is sometimes a little hard. So I've decided to rely on another thing that your brain does pretty heavily, Anthropomorphization. I tend to think of my autonomous self as a hyperactive border collie named Noodles. <laughs> Just lumping all of that together in a nice friendly face. And Noodles is a very smart dog. Not, I mean, he's not always a good dog, but he tries hard. Cognitive biases are a result of hardwiring in your autonomous brain. Interacting with your attentional self, usually in a way to save energy and usually because your intentional self is not paying any damn attention to what's going on. They're kind of a dance that you and Noodles do together. And it requires that inattention on your part, or maybe even effort. Now, cognitive biases are not logical fallacies. A logical fallacy is a logical argument or an error in logical reasoning it shows up in like formal logic or in formal debate. It's not what a cognitive bias is. And a cognitive bias is also not a cognitive distortion. Those are things that show up in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a technique that therapists use to help you overcome uh, negative patterns of thought. They're also not social or implicit biases. A, this is actually really important. A social or implicit bias is an expression of a cognitive bias in a particular place in time. Social biases and implicit biases change over time. If you go back a couple of hundred years, it used to be really cool to be overweight because it meant you were rich and it meant you were sexy. 
and it's no longer true for, ab just trust me on this one. <laughs> the fact that that shifts over time means it's not baked into the firmware of your brain. It's something very specific as an expression in that time and place. And we'll talk a little bit about more, a little more about that later. And cognitive biases are common to all humans. Yes, all humans. You, all of you, and me. Me too. I actually ended up taking a break from talking about cognitive biases for a while because after every talk, I would have a conversation that went more or less like this. Hey, thanks for the talk. I'm really glad you liked it. Thanks for saying so. Yeah, my husband, wife, or this idiot cousin I have does this one thing all the time. <sighs> Look, all of us exhibit every cognitive bias. These are things that are baked into the firmware of your brain. All of us do them all the time. Now, it's not always you're gonna make a mistake. It's things like 51% of the time, 53% of the time, you will make this particular choice that is wrong. Because again, they're a dance between your conscious self and your autonomous self. Your autonomous self is coming to the party with an answer that's incorrect. And your conscious self has a chance to go, woo, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. Now, I mean this though, if you are sitting in this room, breathing oxygen and you have a big wet lump of meat between your ears, I mean you, you do these things and me. Now, cognitive biases started really taking off with this book. We knew about them before, but Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman kicked off a wave of other books. This is by far and away not all of them. But since Kahneman's book came out in 2011, we have just had this endless cavalcade of people throwing up their hands and going, the human being is an irrational animal and we're screwed. <sighs> well, okay, I mean, if that was true, I, I don't know, maybe I would have made this talk just to be a quick 15 minute and then we're all out the door to the party. But there's stuff we can do. In the last several years, we've actually seen a wave of research start coming around to tell us how we can work with these things, not how can we get rid of them because they're baked into your brain, remember, they're not going away, but how can you use techniques and tools to overcome them, to compensate? Because you can't just think your way out of cognitive biases. The other conversation I often have is people are like, well, this is a thing your brain tends to do if you're not paying attention. They're like, oh, great, I just won't do that anymore. I mean, if it was that easy, we wouldn't do it. This is gonna take effort, repeated energy and effort to overcome these things. You're gonna to have to train your intentional mind to work in a particular way, to respond to stimulus in a particular way. So let's cover some of the techniques. These are the ones we're gonna to cover today. Actually, I didn't mention that. Um, a lot of the research from this book, or for this talk, was sourced from this book by Gleb Sapersky, The Blind Spots Between Us. He covers a ton of different techniques. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them, we're just gonna go through that list today. But I really recommend uh, picking this up if you enjoy that talk. So we're gonna talk about identifying and making plans to address biases, delaying our decisions and reactions, probabilistic thinking, making predictions about the future, considering alternative explanations, repeating on the, reflecting on the future and repeating scenarios, considering other people's points of view, getting an external perspective, setting a policy to guide your future self, and practicing mindfulness meditation. So we're gonna go through each of these in turn, fairly short, and then we're gonna talk about some very specific cognitive biases and how to use these to help diffuse them. So let's start with this one, identifying biases and making plans to address them. Because realistically, everything kind of starts with knowledge. You can't use a new processor if you don't know how it handles branch prediction. You can't use a new framework if you don't know how you're expected to do it. You can't train a dog if you don't know how dog brains work. You have to understand what your brain is going to do if you leave it alone in order to compensate for it. Luckily, you're here, so you're already kind of commenting that one. But what I want you to do when we're going through these is to think about each of the biases we're talking about, where is it causing you pain? Where is it harming you in your life and your relationships? And how can you use that pain as fuel to help you overcome it, to help change your patterns and behavior? Focusing on the pain is gonna help you find that motivation. 
So the first actual technique we're going to talk about is delaying our decisions and reactions. This one is huge. I want you to slow down. Move fast and break stuff may work in a Silicon Valley context, but it's not going to cut it here. I want you to go back to kindergarten, and I want you to count to 10 before you respond to somebody, especially if it's an emotional valence, right? If they've said something to upset you. And I want you to take 30 minutes before you make a decision, because that is the about, about, about the amount of time that it's going to take what's called your parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest system to take over from your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight, flight, or freeze thing you've probably heard about. It's going to take about 30 minutes for your brain to calm down and for the smart you to come online and go, oh, maybe we shouldn't do that. And people will totally take advantage of this. If you've gone to a travel website in the last 10 years, they're just all this. They're all trying to make you dumber. They're trying to make you anxious and upset. And there's only three flights left at this. And there's a literal, like kayak, there's a literal timer. Like they're trying to make you make a dumb decision. So you need to take that time and just take 30 minutes and sit on it. Probabilistic thinking is the next technique. How many people love math? Well, I'm disappointing. That's more hands than I expected. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to disappoint all of you and make everybody else very happy because this is the only math in the talk. We're not even going to go through it. Your autonomous system isn't great with numbers, all right? Noodles is just not a numbers guy. It's really more of a kind of yes, no, good, bad, attraction, aversion system. And so you can help diffuse what it's trying to do by thinking in a little bit of probabilisticness. This is Bayesian mathematics, if you're familiar, all right? In Bayesian mathematics or probabilistic thinking, you want to think about what are called base rates. And base rates sounds really mathy and complicated. It's just, what is the actual like, rate at which this event occurs? How much does it really happen? So here's a quick example kind of ripped from my own skull. How many of you have ever gotten a Slack message that looks like this? Yeah, uh, literally every time. Uh, this is what Noodle does. <sighs> yeah, but I've never been fired. Literally never been fired. I suppose we'll see what happens tomorrow after Jerry sees this talk. But I've never been fired from a job. In fact, I have only ever been in trouble a couple of times from a message like this, maybe twice in out of 60 times that this has happened. And those are very conservative numbers. That's 3%. The base rate of me being in trouble is 3%. The base rate of me being fired is 0%. Literally has never happened. So using those base rates to take and counterbalance the emotional response that Noodles is giving me is a way to help diffuse that response. You can also, if you don't like that method, just try making predictions about the future. Turn around, and next time something is dwelling on your mind and you can't let it go, just write it down. Make a prediction. And it is really key that you write it down because your brain has this nasty habit of making predictions, not writing them down, and then conveniently forgetting that you made those predictions, which makes you feel like you're a great predictor. Guarantee you, you are not. If you are, call me. We should do some stock market stuff. But. If you write it down, write your prediction down. And then later, go back and check. Did the catastrophic outcome come to pass? No? Use that next time and go, well, I've written down like eight of these catastrophic scenarios and none of them have ever happened. Maybe it's not going to happen this time. You can also try considering alternative explanations. For instance, if your boss turns around and says, hey, uh, I've got to cancel this meeting that we were going to have in five minutes. I can't get it. Bye. And it's real terse, real short. There are a number of things that your brain could think. But mine is going to come around and think, oh, God, they're mad at me. Because that's how noodles do in my head. 
But there's so many other things that could be happening. They could have a medical emergency. Their kid could be having a medical emergency. They could have engine trouble, car trouble if they're coming into work. They could literally just be un overwhelmed with so much other stuff that they don't even have time to explain to me why they're overwhelmed. Your brain is a narrative generating machine and you can use that. What I want you to do in these situations is just keep hitting the next story button and go, why else could that be true? Why else could that be true? Why else could that be true? Until it stops or, you know, until you have a bunch of them because it really never does stop. And I want you then to circle around and check because more often than not, it's really not about you. Most human beings are wrapped up in their own lives me included. And people don't think about us as much as we often think that they're thinking about us. And again, then you want to circle back and check, verify. Did you have engine trouble? Oh, okay. Yeah. That helps you predict better next time. You can also try reflecting on the future and repeating scenarios. So for instance, if you have a coworker who has committed the cardinal sin of microwaving fish in the work microwave, and they've done it over and over and over again, despite you asking them to stop, do you think it's going to change if you ask them to stop again? Probably not. Has something else changed? Is it worth asking again? Did the fish catastrophically blow up in their face? I mean, that's a good point where you're like, maybe don't do that again. But otherwise, they're likely to continue the same pattern of behavior. So it might not be worth even spending that effort or you know, finding a different way to think about it. You can also try considering other people's perspective. What are the other person's needs? What are their goals? What do they want? Actually, the talk I just gave about conflict had a bunch of helpful tips about that. Because here's the thing. Every single one of us walking around here, uh, we're the hero in our own internal story. We are all out there slaying dragons and goblins and trolls, depending on your, you know, your various internal levels. I don't know. My internal narrative is a little more complicated than others sometimes. But we're all out there doing good. How many people remember who Bernie Madoff is, right? Yeah. A uh, guy ran the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of ever, at least so far. Unless you count crypto. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, but... He is in jail and he's given interviews where he says, oh, the investors knew what was happening. They knew nobody could realistically generate those amount of revenue, that amount of actual income and percentage increase over year over year. They knew what was going on. They just wanted to be in the beginning of it. Bernie Madoff thinks of himself as the hero in his own story. So I mean that just to like everybody does, all right? This coworker you're having an argument with, they think they're the hero. Get into their head and figure out why, what their narrative is. You've probably heard the phrase, assume good intent. Now that phrase can be problematic uh, for a number of different reasons, because if you have somebody actually behaving problematically, assuming good intent is not always useful or helpful. But if you're engaging with people on a regular basis, Kind of assume, okay, that they have a good intent and work your way back from there. Maybe you don't accept their behavior, but it at least help you understand where they're coming from. You can also get an external perspective. This one's super helpful. Because often in conflict, our scope narrows. We can't see outside of the scope of that conflict. So adding somebody else who can see those things can really help defuse the situation can point out things that your brain is literally not letting you see in that moment. The next technique is setting a policy to guide your future self. In the moment, it is real tough to remember to do any of this. And so you can put it on yourself to not think about that in the moment. Set it up so you are locked in already. People ever heard of the technique of like freezing your credit cards in a block of ice so you have to melt them? I don't know how that was ever supposed to stop you from reading the numbers. But, you know, it was a thing people did. That's a technique to help you force that thinking time. You're trying to prevent yourself from making a mistake. And you can do that with policies, with habits, with plans, with other human beings. So as an example, I love Legos, like a lot. Um, 
I have a bunch, this is my, over my desk at work. And actually you can see I've started colonizing the next cubicle and we've gone down the road and there's more since that. I've started getting into this. Like, it's fine, he's almost never at his desk, it's cool. Uh, here's the kicker, I'm not allowed to buy Legos. And it's not like I have made a mistake and I was prohibited. Lego does not have like my face on a little thing at the store, although that would be hysterical. But it's more, if I start buying Lego, I don't know where the bottom on that is, folks, and I want to avoid that situation. So it's my rule. I don't buy Lego for myself. I'm, I'm allowed to buy them for my niece, nieces. And what that means is when I encounter something like this when I'm at a conference in Sweden, a 50% off sale on Lego, which almost never goes on sale, I'm allowed to go, you know, just walk past and be like, not today, Satan. <laughs> the last technique, what? You'll probably get more geese. <laughs> That's, hmm. <laughs> we'll talk a, bit, a little bit actually toward the end about uh, the difference between an absolute policy versus a one that's flexible. But the last technique we're gonna talk about is practicing mindfulness meditation. Um, the thing of it is, mindfulness meditation is actually super valuable. It provably helps you deal with cognitive bias because mindfulness meditation is one of the best ways that I know of and at least as far as the science I have read has knows of, to help you notice when Noodles throws a thought over that wall. It's the best way to look at it and go, wait a minute, that thought just popped up out of nowhere. Why is that there? Do I believe it? Do I agree with it? And to me, that revelation was actually mind blowing because like, I don't know about you, I think a ton of stupid stuff all the time. And the ability to look at thought and just go, that's stupid and throw it away was great, because now I don't have to believe all the stupid shit that comes out of my head. It makes you more able to delay your gut impulses. Even just 10 minutes a day of mindfulness meditation can provably, like in terms of studies, help you fight cognitive biases. I really recommend it as a technique. So, okay, let's talk about cognitive biases. Uh, we're gonna talk about each of these. <laughs> so I hope you're ready to strap in. No, we're gonna talk about a select number of these. This is actually on a poster outside of my cube. Uh, and this was like, what, 2017? So it's been more since then, I guarantee you. We're finding constantly all of these weird ways that your brain tries to save energy and save you time and work faster. But today we're gonna to talk about the tribalism, tri tribalism, which is the horns effect and the halo effect. We're gonna talk about attribution errors, the fundamental attribution error, the group attribution error, and the ultimate attribution error. And then we're gonna talk about a bunch of stuff that sounds like D&D, &D, illusory superiority, the curse of knowledge, and the gap of empathy. All right, so let's start with tribalism. Uh, humans form groups really easily. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you have a kid like in Little League or something, suddenly you care a lot about that team and how it does against other teams. But it was before, like people like me, I have no skin in that game. I don't care at all about Little League. In fact, we do this so easily that there was a psychologist named Tajville uh, back in the 1970s who wanted to do a bunch of experiments and figure out about how, how easily humans form groups. And he was doing this because he actually wanted to help cure fascism, which is a huge lofty goal. He was trying to figure out why the Holocaust happened. And so he said, okay, well, I'm trying to figure out why human beings form groups that hate each other. So we're just gonna start dialing it all the way back to really meaningless things. Groups that have no bearing in any kind of demographics or anything that is real in the world. And so what he did, it was called the minimal group paradigm experiments. What he ended up doing was he brought in a bunch of kids from Oxford and he showed them a paper that he had a number of dots on. And he had them count the number of dots. And then he took their answer and he basically threw it away. And he flipped a coin. And based on the coin flip, he said, you're an overestimator or an underestimator. And he painted these up as like, you are a person who habitually overestimates or a person who habitually underestimates. Like they were psychological concepts. They're not, they're not real. Those aren't things. So. He's taken something and he's 
you know, had them take a test, thrown the answer out, and randomly assigned them to a group that doesn't exist, all right? Then he handed them five pounds, which I guess is dollars in this case. And then he presented them two names, one of them who was an overestimator and one of them who was an underestimator. And he said, you have to assign this money between these two people. Now, neither of those people exist. So let's sum up. We have a concept that doesn't exist that people were randomly assigned to, and now you're picking between assigning money to two people that do not exist. One of those is in your group and one of them is not. And every single person put more money toward the person who was in their group. They've never met these people because they don't exist. They know nothing about them than the name and what group they're in. That's how easily we form groups. We form in groups and out groups. In groups are groups that we are in. Out groups are groups that we are not in. And this is where we start to see the specter of implicit bias raise its head. Because remember, these aren't the same thing as social biases. I like to think of it as like a paw print. The paw print is the social bias. The paw itself is the cognitive bias. It's the thing causing it, but that expression is going to be different over time and place. So let's talk about the actual cognitive bias of the horns effect. Time for another story. Um, I had a tech lead at one point. His name was Nick. And Nick loved to read Agile blogs back at the point in time when this was extremely trendy. And Nick loved to try fun new things in retrospectives and try other things. And Nick was not always very good at explaining what was happening or why he was doing these things. And so Nick decided at one point that everybody in his team was going to play improv exercises before we did our retrospectives. And I said, that sounds cool. You go do that and I'll be over here when you're ready to start the meeting. Because I had a, like, looked at Nick and I'd basically well, not just made a snap judgment, but I knew or thought I knew who Nick was. And I did not like his, actually, I didn't like a number of things about Nick, including the fact that he liked the Dart programming language a lot. Anybody remember Google Dart? No. Yeah, that's how successful that was. Now, here's the thing. I run a workshop now on giving and receiving feedback. Do you know what I make people do before they sit through my workshop? I make them do improv exercises because they're actually really good at getting people outside of their own head and getting them to start thinking as a group about other people. Nick didn't explain that and I made assumptions because of the horns effect. The horns effect says if we dislike one aspect of a person, we irrationally dislike all aspects of that person across the board, especially if they're in one of our outgroups. So if we don't like the way a person looks or dresses or talks or their gender or how much they weigh or anything about them, we tend to value them less highly as a technical contributor. We actually rate them lower on the skill set, regardless of what their actual skill is. We view that person as bad. So how do we solve this? What do we do about this? Well, the first technique we can use is delaying your reactions. Take a delay before you judge new people. Force yourself to sit down and say, I'm going to wait 15 days before I have an opinion about this person. Or I'm going to participate in these experiment, there were these uh, retrospective uh, exercises for a couple of days, a couple of times before I say, this is stupid. Remember that we tend to undervalue overweight people, disabled people, people with foreign accents, and on and on and on. Anybody who's in an outgroup from you. You can also make predictions about the future. Write down your gut feeling and check its accuracy later. You'd be like, well, this is going to be stupid. Tack that up on the wall. Come back to it a month later and be like, yeah, I was, I was right. Or not. Ask yourself, will a new coworker actually be bad at coding? Now, the flip side of the horn effect is the halo effect. And the halo effect is pretty much the opposite. If you like one aspect of someone, you will irrationally rate them higher on all aspects of their existence. The canonical example of this is attractiveness. We tend to think attractive people are better, smarter, faster, better politicians. Um, you know, the list goes on. 
you're more likely to hire attractive people and promote them. And it happens for almost exactly the same reasons as the Horn Effect. It's just the way your brain tends to work. So what do we do about this? Well, we can reflect on the future and on repeating scenarios. Think about that person as if they were some kind of alien, as if they were a robot. Try and reduce them in your head and think about their core competencies and capabilities. Or just ask yourself, have your opinions of people you like or are attracted to always valid? Mine have not. I don't know about you. Maybe you're better than I am. You can also set a policy to guide your future self. If you're in a position to start hiring, establish metrics before you even start to hire people. And those can be qualitative or quantitative. Don't just stick with numbers, all right? But if you are using numbers, you have to inflate them by about 30% or deflate them by about 30% if you're attracted to that person or you like them a lot. That's about the level of the horns effect. It's significant. The next chunk of things we're going to talk about are attribution errors. We're going to start with one of my favorites, the fundamental attribution error. Is it weird that I have a favorite cognitive bias? It's probably weird. So it's time for another story. Different job from all the others. Um, I used to have a coworker named Josh. And Josh used to fall asleep at his desk. And I don't mean like cutesy, like, I'm going to sleep like this. Like, I mean head back, snoring in his desk chair. And my team and I, we laughed at him. We're like, who does that? We made fun of him. Behind his back, of course. None of us ever asked Josh, hey, are you okay? Is anything going on? Is there something we can do to help? And I will never know. I've never met him. I've seen him a couple of times since, but I've never like actually asked him because that would be extremely awkward. But why did my coworkers and I assume the worst? Why did the rest of the team assume that he was just being lazy. In fact, the story we told her at the time, or told ourselves at the time, was uh, Diablo 3 had just come out, that he was staying up all late all night playing Diablo 3. Maybe that was true. We never checked it. We assume the worst, because Noodles' job is to hold a model of the world in your head. This is really good, because it allows him to arrive at quick decisions that don't cost a lot of energy and approximations that work a lot of the time. But people are really complex. You can't fit another whole person inside of your head, either physically or, you know, logically. And so we do this thing called the fundamental attribution error. And what the fundamental attribution error says is that my actions are due to my surrounding circumstances, but your actions are due to your inherent attributes. So I overslept due to insomnia, I was frustrated by a poor coffee experience, and I'm overwhelmed by job stress. But you are lazy, angry, and sloppy. See how that works? We have the narrative, at least we think we have the narrative, of why we are behaving the way we do. But we attribute it to and other people to inherent attributes about them. So what can we do about that? Well, you can delay your reactions. Instead of immediately accepting the answer noodle sucks over that wall, you be curious about the other person even explicitly ask them questions. Is this person actually this, or is it due to their circumstances? You could take a person, for instance, that cuts you off in traffic and say, well, is it likely? You know, what, is it likely that they're a jerk? Or are there surrounding circumstances? You can also make a prediction about the future behavior. Predict if they're gonna repeat that behavior and write it down. And if they do, it's more likely that they are that attribute. It's more likely that that is common and, or excuse me, a common pattern in how they behave. So if you meet the same person on the road multiple days in a row and they cut you off, it's more likely that there's a jerk. It's less likely that they're rushing their wife to the hospital to give birth for eight days in a row. The next attribution error is the group attribution error. And the group attribution error has two types. The first of which is any member of a group I'm not part of is representative of that group. So the QA analyst is a jerk and fails my tickets for the most nitpicky stuff. So all QA analysts are jerks. QED, right? 
There's also type two. The group's overall attributes are representative of every person in that group. So if I already view all salespeople as slimy weasels who will promise anything and leave me over a barrel just to make the deal, then when I meet the new salesperson, I'm gonna believe that she is a slimy weasel who will leave me over a barrel, regardless of if that's true or not. This is the heart of stereotyping. Applying attributes from individuals to the group and vice versa. So what do we do about this? How do we solve it? Well, start by considering alternative explanations. Individuals each have circumstances. What are theirs? What is leading that particular behavior? Maybe locking sales staff into commission-based fee structures is not the greatest idea because it leads to negative outcomes, behaviors that I don't enjoy. You can also get an external perspective. Somebody else, especially with a different background, then you can help counter Noodle's first responses. The next attribution error and the last one is the ultimate attribution error, which I think because they'd already used fundamental, they just had to go up from there. And the ultimate attribution error is interestingly the fundamental attribution error, but applied to groups, except they'd already used the group attribution error. It's, it's real confusing. Don't worry about it. The ultimate one though says, my in-group's attributes are due to our surrounding circumstances, and my out-group's attributes are due to their inherent attributes. So developers have to deal with strenuous deadlines. We're never rewarded for flexibility, and we get unclear definitions that we have to deal with all the time. But QA are angry, picky, and argumentative. And this actually shows up in a bunch of interesting ways. For instance, QA often get paid less than developers for the same amount of years of experience. And the UAE will actually tell you that that's because they're less skilled, which isn't necessarily true. So how do we solve that? Well, we can start by considering the other person's perspective. What do they think? What do they believe? And can you be confident in your assumptions about what they think? For instance, how many things do you think your QA knows that you don't? Because I guarantee you the answer is higher than zero. You can also try probabilistic thinking. What have your experiences actually been in the past? Don't use what's noodles is coming to you with the thing, but look, go back to your memory and ask, do I have actual data for this or am I making up things? So, that's it for attribution errors. We're gonna talk next about illusory superiority. This one's fun, especially because of the source of the data. Because you believe you are better than other people in pretty much every way that matters. I mean, don't get me wrong, I do too. There was a University of Nebraska faculty survey in 1977 where 68% of the faculty rated themselves in the top 25%. More than 90% rated themselves above average. I don't have to tell you that's not how math works. We believe we are better than we actually are. Now, that's okay. It has some clear evolutionary benefit. This gets us up and out of bed in the morning. This is the thing that says that we can read a couple of books on psychology and give talks about it to rooms full of developers. <laughs> It's the thing that made me think this was a good idea, that I could do that. It's because we overlook a bunch of things on the you know, potential problems and pitfalls. And again, that can be beneficial. But it can also make us a jerk. It can make us feel like we're smarter than our boss. Like we're better at work than our teammates and that we do more. And generally make us an asshole. So what do we do about that? Well, we can consider others' perspective. That person is the hero in their own story too. How can that be if both of you are the heroes and you're both better than average? Who would have thought? Try to break it down and consider their perspective. You can also consider alternative explanations. What if you don't know more than them? What if you're not better than them? What would the outcome of that be? What would the signs of that be? 
Or what if Noodle's thoughts about the uh, correct design just aren't right? Because a lot of times what you have as thoughts are Noodle's leaping to the fore and saying, this is familiar. And so what you often tend to think of as the correct path is the thing that is most familiar. The next cognitive bias is the curse of knowledge. Curse of knowledge is interesting because your brain, as it turns out, can't unknow a thing. Like once you learn something, you can forget it. But if you know it and you remember it, you can't imagine what it is like to not know it. It's impossible, especially if it's something you do regularly. So when you get angry at your kids or somebody else because they're not following common sense, that's something you've internalized some behavior, some expectation that you have internalized. And you cannot imagine why these people are doing these things when this is obviously true. Well, it might not be in their heads. When we teach people, junior developers, etc., we get frustrated because it's so obvious, it's so easy. And as a result, we push learners far too far, far too fast. We basically built ourselves a ladder, pulled it up after us, and then we're mad that somebody can't get up to where we are. So what do we do about that? Well, the first technique we can use is considering their perspective. What do they already know? All right, find that out first. Then, what is the smallest possible bit of knowledge that they could know next? And how do you tie that into their existing knowledge? This is pedagogy. This is teaching. This is why teachers are underpaid in this country because nobody understands that this is what they do every day. The last cognitive bias we're gonna talk about is the empathy gap. You ever wonder what happens to your brain when there's donuts in the break room? <laughs> uh, I do, because I go into a fugue state and then the donuts are gone. We underestimate the effects of emotions on other people. We tend to understate how much the emotion is actually going to affect what they're thinking, their emotions, how they believe. Emotions can be really powerful. They change how we think. So it's not a big deal for you, it can be a huge deal for somebody else. And this isn't true for just other people. We underestimate the effects of emotions on us. This is called the hot-cold empathy gap. In cold state, when we're chilled and calm and the intentional self is ready to roll, we're in cold state. When noodles is riding high and we have a bunch of opinions and emotions, we're in hot state. And the fascinating thing about this is that your brain actually views yourself in these other states as different people. Like the portions of your brain when you think of yourself do not light up when you think of yourself in those moments. And the same is actually true for future you. So when you say, well, future me will do it, it's like you're chucking it down the road for a future person to deal with, which is great, except then future you gets that and is like, that jerk. You're a stranger to yourself in a lot of cases. This is why it's often very difficult to do things like um, prohibiting yourself from doing something. Because in the cold state, you can say, oh, sure, I'm going to get up and go to the gym at 5.30 in the morning. We're going to do that Monday. And then 5.30 rolls around, and hot state, you go, the hell I will. I don't know what that person was thinking, but they're dumb. We're staying in bed. So what can you do about that? Well, you can consider other people's points of view if you're working with other people. Try to envision what you would feel like with their background and situation. If they're being what you perceive as emotional and it doesn't make sense to you, try to understand where they're coming from and what might have triggered it. What might be causing that emotional state? What things do you think are important to them? If this is something that they have cared about in the past or been emotional about in the past, you can use that as a trigger. You can do this with your past and future selves too. Notice, okay, I'm gonna be that person 
in, you know, when the break room donuts happen, I'm going to be break room donuts art. So I have to think about what break room donuts art wants, and he wants the one with the sprinkles. So we have to figure out how he and I are going to not eat all of that donut or any of it. You can try making predictions about the future. Predict what they care about based on their past behavior. And anticipate those emotions when you're in a cold state. You can also try setting policies for yourself and set them when you are in cold state. Again, it can be hard in that moment. And this is why absolute policies are actually easier to hold to sometimes than fuzzy ones. Because I can easily go, okay, I'll just eat half the donut. Well, now there's only half of that. Okay, I'll eat half of that. And maybe a little bit more of that. And then that Zeno's paradox my way around an entire donut, and there's only crumbs left. If I just say no donut, and it has to extend, it almost has to be like I do not eat break room food. Now that's, I've done the Lego one. I can't quite make that one work. <laughs> Now, this is normally where I would review, all right? Sum up, send you out into the world with a bunch of knowledge, but it's not gonna matter. Now, that really sounds nihilistic when I say it, but learning isn't the only thing you need here. Like I said, it is going to take effort. You are going to have to prepare, and part of the preparation for dealing with these is consciously, cognitively, intentionally engaging with them and the strategies you are going to use to diffuse them. How many people have ever had somebody canvas them for voting? Okay, how many of you had that person ask, hey, can you tell me where you're gonna vote or who you're gonna vote with? Can you make plans to do that and tell me those plans? Okay, Other, the rest of you, they were very bad canvassers because that technique actually provably makes more people go out and vote because you've thought about it, you've envisioned it. You've worked through in your head, okay, well, I'm gonna do this and I'll go after work on Tuesday. And so Tuesday rolls around and it's like, oh, okay, well, I've already made all the plans, it's fine. I don't have to think about it. A one hour talk is not gonna cut it here, all right? Listening to someone talk about exercising is not the same thing as exercising. Just so I can seem erudite, here's some Aristotle. Uh, it's well said then, by doing acts that the just person is produced and by doing temperate acts, the temperate person. Without doing these, no one would even have a prospect of becoming good. The doing of the act is the thing that shapes you, the thing that changes you. So I recommend you either go back through the recording, through the slides, or better yet, go read book, the book. He does a way better job of explaining this than I do. I mean, because it's his job. <laughs> but he also actually has portions in the book where he's like, nope, stop, finish the chapter, like, and go write in a notebook what your, like, the places this has hurt you, what your strategies are going to be. And I absolutely encourage you to go through and do those exercises as well. So instead of a summary, here's a couple things I want you to walk away knowing. Being aware and conscious of the reactions and responses you get from the dark forest is gonna go a long way. You have to live with noodles. There is no other option. So do not let him sabotage the things in life that are worth living, the relationships that help make your life what it is. Because working together, you can sally forth and take on the world. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be up here if you have questions. Uh, I'll be at the attendee party, uh, and then I'll be at the Avature booth basically most of tomorrow. So feel free to find me if you have questions or comments. There's stickers up here. Uh, thanks again for listening.